Hello, I'm Bill Haney. We're going to have a conversation, and you're invited to sit in. Tonight's guest is Alyssa Slotkin. Alyssa brings an incredible background, a wealth of public service to our country and to our community. Importantly, she also brings an all too rare quality. She has an inexhaustible work ethic. And she brings something else too. She brings a vision for a better future for our kids, along with a proven ability in very high pressure situations to work with others, to make that vision a reality. She has a passion to do what is necessary to get things done and to make things better. Alyssa has dedicated her life to national service. She's a Holly resident who is running to represent Michigan's 8th Congressional District. We've come to a point at which we seem to have no shortage of people raising their voices to drown out the other gals or guys' opinion. That volume and the intensity of rhetoric doesn't seem to be elevating anyone's understanding and it sure isn't increasing civility in the land. Perhaps it would be a useful change of pace to just have some quiet conversations, especially when you can talk with someone like Alyssa Slotkin, a person who brings experience, credentials, a wealth of talent, and a true dedication to help and serve others. Alyssa, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Bill. It's an understatement to say that Alyssa Slotkin has already had what most people would consider a remarkable and full career of service in highly important roles. But now she is taking her commitment to public service to help us rise above divisive politics and to put our country and our community ahead of everything else. Alyssa, it seems that you come by your work ethic from your childhood days. I know you grew up on a farm just west of here in the countryside near Holly. Would it be a good guess that those early days left a lasting impression on you? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, my family was in the meat business and we had a farm in Holly that at the time when I was a little girl growing up there had uh, beef cattle. And uh, certainly being in a family business, the values of integrity, um, service to your community, that your handshake is your bond is something that I was taught, I mean, before I can even remember being taught it. It was something that was understood, something I'm really proud of, and it's something that helped me throughout my career, that early, early training. And your family was involved in a, a product that became very well known in Detroit and throughout Michigan and elsewhere. Yeah, we're hot dog people, as I like to say. <laughs> so we had a, a meat company in downtown Detroit, High Grade Foods, and we helped start Nathan's Hot Dogs, and we invented the Ballpark Frank at Tiger Stadium. So hot dogs um, in my house are an appetizer at a barbecue. Mm. Uh, we grill hot dogs, and then we go in for the, the real meat. Um, but uh, um, it's something that has been a part of my life since, you know, forever. And they plump when you cook them. They do, they do. Yeah. Well, tell us a bit about your background in service. Uh, it's incredible. I, I don't know very many people, in fact, I can't name one, who has worked in the State Department, Department of Defense, and worked for Republican and Democrat administrations. And I know you did some tours in Iraq. Yeah. So um, I happened to be in New York City on 9-11 when um, the towers were hit. So I had always been interested in international affairs from when I was a little girl here in Michigan. But um, when the smoke cleared on that day, I really knew that national service was what I was going to spend the rest of my life doing. Within a year of that, I was recruited into the CIA. And within a year of that, I was voluntold, as we say, to go to Iraq mm -hmm. on my first tour. And I you know, uh, carried a weapon, put on my body armor, and I would travel with the military trying to understand the terrorist groups and militia groups that were shooting at US forces and plotting at the US, against the US homeland. So I did that first tour, and I ended up doing three tours. I would go, I would come back. I would go, and I would come back. And in between those tours in Baghdad, 
I was working for national security agencies. I worked, as you said, the Department of Defense, the State Department, and the White House. And um, one of the things that I'm really proud of, especially in this day and age, is that I have a very bipartisan resume. My experience in national security is very bipartisan. You know, I did three tours in Iraq, and no one ever asked me what party I was from, because it didn't matter, because mm -hmm. you were focused on the mission of helping U.S. forces, of you know, protecting the U.S. homeland. And one of the reasons I decided to you know, continue my life in service through public service and public office was because we don't have enough of that bipartisan spirit in our domestic politics, that can-do mission focus. And I think that's sorely, sorely missing right now. Well, the mission is a very big part of your life. I know yeah. that. And that I know you're interested in working across the board and yeah. talking with people of all points of view and perhaps reintroducing civility yep. into the conversation. Yeah, I think, you know, my experience, we're all, we're all trained by our life experience. And for me, you know, when there were tough problems, like when I was a CIA officer and we would find out about a plot against the U.S. homeland, we'd have vociferous debate about what to do and how to foil that plot. Right? Some would want to foil it immediately. Some would want to contact another government. We'd have a whole debate. But we never had the option of just saying, you know what, that problem's too tough. I'm going to walk away from the table. And I think that's what really gets me about our Congress right now, is the hardest problems, the ones we so desperately need leadership on, are the ones they walk away when things get too hard. So, and civility is key to that. You can't get things done and compromise and work across the aisle unless you have civility and you respect the other side. So that's something I hope uh, to bring if I'm elected. And also, true leadership. Uh, yeah. Very frequently, w we've had leaders at all levels, I think, who take polls and they determine right. from that what people want and then they spend right. their time t telling people, I'm gonna give you what, what you want. Right. Uh, and I think true leadership is not just looking at the short term and what will get a vote right. and what will make a stockholder uh, happy uh, with the next quarterly report, but right. rather looking further into the future and saying, is this a good thing for uh, my organization and my country? And I think even locally to take a mundane example would be potholes. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. that the patch jobs that we've been doing, especially in Michigan. Yeah. Um, we, we know we spend, in this case, $175 million, the governor has said about spending, just to do a patch job. Right. And I know that uh, you can extrapolate that to the national level, and many of the things that we seem to be doing uh, are to, a brief patch job on a, on a problem and not a long-term solution. Yeah, I think that's an apt metaphor for what's going on in Washington. It's about having some sort of strategic vision and about saying that you know what is more important is to push forward, look out forward a few years, five years, ten years, instead of just thinking about getting yourself reelected and what's going to happen in six months. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the reasons I'm so glad there's so many veterans and people who have served in combat zones who are running across the country because they've had experience being public servants, thinking out more than six months and doing the right thing, even if that's the hard mm -hmm. thing or the politically you know, difficult thing. But can one person really uh, make a difference? I've heard so many times that, from people that they're, they become cynical uh, about the electoral process and, well, what difference does my vote make? We found out in the last election yeah. that uh, a number of voters that wouldn't even fill the University of Michigan football stadium in three states yeah. uh, totally change the election. So every vote does matter, it seems, but do you feel that the individual voice of a, of a voter uh, is, is really consequential? I do, I do, and, and we certainly saw that, as you said, in spades in the last election. Um, and I, I just refuse to be cynical about it because it's our country. And if we give up on it, what does that mean, right? This is, the U.S. Congress was established in Article I of the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. If we're not willing to fight for that and say, you know what, we deserve better than what we have, I mean, then what are we doing, right? So I feel very strongly um, that people's vote still does count. Um, and, and I think that 
people, especially in the past year and a half, have sort of said, you know what, my country is worth fighting for, my democracy is worth fighting for, and they're doing more than they've done in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel it, I feel optimistic because every day I'm talking with volunteers to our campaign who have never been politically active before in their life. It was just never something they thought of doing. And they're just looking around at the tenor and tone of politics, and they're saying, no, our country is better than this, and I'm going to do my part. And so it's hard not to feel optimistic when you're doing that every day. I think we've, per perhaps what you're saying, I hope, is that we've gone, maybe we're going beyond cynicism, uh, and we're into an era, and perhaps what's been happening uh, elsewhere in the country on certain issues is energized uh, different blocks of voters and some people that have not been active. Uh, we've all heard about uh, the pink wave and the number of, of women who are candidates and uh, the young people that are stepping forward yeah. on key issues. So perhaps that gives us some uh, encouragement and some optimism. Oh yes, I mean the activation on the ground on both sides of the aisle on all kinds of different issues is inspiring. And it's a real thing. I know that uh, when you've spoken with groups, I've heard back from a few about the issues that really aren't those that would concern or be the responsibility for uh, our U.S. Congress. For example, we, we did mention the potholes, but that the larger issues, perhaps the infrastructure. Yes. Nationally, uh, that we've inherited a incredible system of, of roads and of water and uh, electricity, which seems to many of us to be disintegrating before yeah. our eyes. Yeah. And that would seem to me to be a major issue facing uh, Congress currently yeah. and, uh, in, and the incoming one in November, which isn't that far away. Well, this is why it's important when we talk about leadership, right? we have a generational problem on our hands in terms of our infrastructure. It is we are aging out of our infrastructure. And so our leaders in Washington should be getting together and saying what kind of extremely lucrative package do we need to pass in order to truly get through this generational moment. And obviously roads are the most visible thing and we've all I'm sure had you know a flat or had I've, I've had my windshield cracked just we all mm. pay the price mm. for that um, infrastructure problem, but the other thing is our water systems, our bridges, things we don't see as clearly, um, but affect us and our kids mm -hmm. deeply. But instead of having that really sort of generational conversation among leaders who look out more than a year or two, we're having a conversation about how to get states to pay, how to get our businesses to pay. It, it, from what I've heard, we're not going to get that kind of windfall. And all the jobs that would come if we actually spent significant money on mm -hmm. our infrastructure. So uh, that's something that, for me, I think is a, a huge missed opportunity. And if I was lucky enough to get elected, I would address immediately. We need a generational conversation about our infrastructure. And that ties directly to taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and politicians have been saying, in fact, locally, when they knock on my door and say, I'm going to be running for so and so. And if I'm elected, I'm going to cut your taxes. Yeah. Uh, to which I respond, then you're not going to get my vote. Mm -hmm. Because uh, short term tax cuts uh, are really long term significant tax increases. And I think that's to tie back to what you said about leadership. I think our leaders, our political leaders, need, need to communicate to citizens that sometimes a few pennies more in tax is necessary in order to solve these major infrastructure issues that we've got to deal with. Yeah. I believe in treating our federal budget the way any of us treat our household budget. If you're going to do a lot of spending, you do have a responsibility to show how you're going to pay for it, right? We don't get in our own lives to just spend out of control and not explain to our spouse or our kids what we're going to where we're going to have to tighten our belt. I believe in that. Um, and I believe that sometimes additional spending is required, like on infrastructure, that's truly a generational mm -hmm. issue. But I think it's also a responsibility to explain to people where, how we're going to get that money. So to me, that's the, the, one of the problems in Washington. We had a, a tax bill that passed in December, and I'm all for tax reform. We need it, right? But they didn't explain their math. They didn't show their math. Where is that bill going to be paid down? 
If not, then we're just going to live with a dangerous amount of debt. And as someone who cares about um, planning for the future and the unexpected, I don't like to carry that much debt. So um, I, I think it's about being honest about how we're going to spend our money, being transparent. And that's why people don't trust the government with their money, because they don't know how it's going to be spent. I think that mm -hmm. if we increase transparency, people might be more interested in understanding some of the gives and takes. Well, you've mentioned a number of things that are crucial, high priority items. Uh, would you say then that uh, infrastructure and uh, obviously national defense, which we haven't really talked about that much, mm -hmm. but uh, those are among your priority items. They are. Infrastructure, I think, has got to be on the, in the top of the list um, in terms of things that will not only help us every day, but allow us to be more economically competitive, right? Big businesses aren't going to want to relocate here if the bridges and the roads aren't ready for use, mm -hmm. you know, if they're going to have a flat every time a truck's going to come back to headquarters. Um, so that's certainly critical. And then I think we have some generational things we need to take care of in our economy. Right. We have um, right now, vacancies galore in Oakland County, in our robotics firms, on IT, cybersecurity, um, in advanced manufacturing, and in healthcare. Then you drive 40 miles down the road, and the young people are all asking me, like, hey, what should I go into? Mm -hmm. What jobs are going to be well paid and have a pension and a future? Um, and that's just a mismatch right there. Our companies are hiring from out of state and out of the country, and we have young people ready to work who have grown up mm -hmm. using computers. So additional strategic planning and our community colleges training that pipeline right into our businesses, uh -huh. where if you go to school and you go to work part-time for those companies and you graduate well, you go right into well-paid mm -hmm. jobs. That's what we need to be working on. Matching the, the needs with the resources, which right touches on one of the issues that uh, is often overlooked, and that is uh, the failure to use some of our most important resources, and by which I don't mean necessarily physical ones, but uh, among our, our geezer population, which I'm uh, a resident of, uh, we have an enormous wealth of experience, often very hard come by. Mm -hmm. People have made mistakes. That's right. And um, it doesn't seem that we're tapping into that and using and the exploiting in the best sense of that word, the talents and resources right. and energy represented by our older population. Yeah. Well, it's certainly, I've certainly become aware of how underutilized this group is because so many of them have become our volunteers on the campaign. Some of our absolute best volunteers are senior citizens who have had a wealth of experience over a lifetime of work, who now are ready to volunteer for, for a cause that they believe in. Um, and I can't believe some of the folks who are walking mm. through the door, the wealth of that experience, which will benefit us, but I'm surprised that no one else is accessing that mm. talent. And it's the kind of thing, again, that just a bit more strategic planning to match the needs to the resources in the community, we'd be doing that, right? We'd be bringing in advisory groups, especially for our local government, right? We could have an amazing um, sort of kitchen cabinet of senior, uh, senior citizens who could help our local governments improve. But I haven't seen that done mm. or not done well. So there's lots to do, and uh, we are certainly feeling the advantages of having lots of senior citizen volunteers. Well, it's been very helpful and very enlightening to hear what you've got to say on these issues. And I hope that going forward that our leaders can exercise and bring true leadership and, and do the resource utilization and do the planning and bring people together to reach across the yeah. aisle. And, uh, because it's not going to be solved, any of these issues, uh, in a strictly partisan way. At least that's my opinion. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time from your campaign to be with us. And I want to wish you good luck going thank forward. You. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, I appreciate Alyssa. you doing this. Thanks. My pleasure.